Okay, hey again, welcome to week 10 of our foundations course. And this week we are talking about eschatology, the doctrine of future things and heaven and hell. Last week we looked at the doctrine of angels and demons and um, the effects of sin and all those things and, and, the, and the real aspects of how angels were created and the fall of those angels uh, and demons as well. So here we are ready to move into the future things. And the future things is an important doctrine for us to talk about because uh, it helps set the stage of what's to come. And Christ fulfilled all the prophecies except for one we discussed in our previous uh, issues on the foundations course and the, the prophecy he has not yet fulfilled is the fact that he is going to come again in his second coming the return of Christ back to earth for his bride and so the bride of Christ we talked about is our church is the church not our church but the universal church those who believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross is the redeemed and so Christ is going to come back for the redeemed so eschatology then is this study of the last things or the things that are coming at the end of life that when for ordinary history in humanity and the ordinary history of the world Christ's return is going to set the stage for something new and so we've talked about how sin has affected the human race and every aspect of the of, of the culture and the world has been affected by the fall that occurred in the garden and discussing this topic of eschatology will help us put into perspective the end of life and what that means for the believers so as we go forward in this um, there's a lot that we do not know and there's speculation and different um, discussions and viewpoints on what we're going to talk about. For the standard of this, this meeting today, we're going to talk about what this means for you as the believer and how heaven and hell are part of that conversation as well. Okay, So as we jump into this, eschatology has to do with the biblical prophecies about the end times. And when we're talking about the end times, we're talking the second coming and when Christ comes back to reign on the earth. Um, the first time that Christ came, he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. The next time he comes, he's coming as the Lion of Judah. And demolition and vengeance will be in his hand, but he's going to come for the redeemed, his church, the bride of Christ, what he died for. And so here are some terms that we need to associate ourselves with as we're going through this discussion. The first is what we've already alluded to, the second coming of Christ. And this is the return of Christ at an unknown time in the future, according to John 14, 3, that he was talking to his disciples in the upper room. And he says, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And uh, this place is so that you will be ready, it will be ready for you and ready to receive you. And you do not know the hour that I'm coming back is what he told his disciples. And that is the illusion of the second coming. And so this is a, a powerful teaching that we need to, as believers, that's what our hope is in. That is the one day that we're going to be adorned as the bride of Christ, ready for him, the groom, to come and receive us. And so that is a, a glorious day that we look forward to, and that is called the second coming. The rapture is also another term that we need to understand, and this is the sudden departure of all Christians to meet Christ in the air, according to First, the, First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. The rapture, we do not know how it's all going to unfold. There's many theories how this plays out. We'll get into some of those in just a few minutes. But for the sake of this argument right now, the rapture is the sudden departure of all Christians to meet Christ our King in the air. And I don't know all the details of how that works out, and I don't think anybody does, but there's some good stories, some good theological discussions out there about these things, and we'll jump into those too. The millennium is also a term that we need to address, and this refers to the period of time which Christ reigns on the earth in righteousness. That will be a 1,000-year reign. And uh, as we're discussing eschatology and these future things, according to Revelation 20, 1 through 10, this is where we get a lot of our understanding of the end times and what's to take place and the Christ return and how he's coming. All is in found in, usually in the book of Revelation with some in First and Second Thessalonians and then a couple scriptures here and there in, in what the Pauline epistles have written. But as we look at this, and the millennium refers to this period of time that Christ will reign on the new earth that is set up in the new Jerusalem. And so it'll be a glorious day. And then there's this other term that comes along with that, and that is the Great Tribulation. This is a period of an intense, unprecedented suffering 
on the earth. Now, we could argue that some may feel like they're in tribulation right now and the, you know, the effects of the world, the way that it's going and falling apart may be the effects of tribulation today. But what we're told is if we read in Revelation where the wrath of God is being poured out on the earth, those days are terrible. Uh, each bowl that the angel pours out is just more and more wrath of the of the injustice of the justice of God being poured out on the earth. And so there's a couple of different views on the Great Tribulation. This intense period of suffering, um, some say, uh, is there's three different views that we'll discuss. And, and these are important for the framing of the way that you believe and how you decide what you understand. I don't really understand how it all plays out. I, I, I would probably lean one way or the other, and we'll discuss that here in a second. But according to Mark 13, 19, there will be a period of seven years of just unprecedented judgment on the earth. Uh, that will come at a time that is, we don't know when, and we do, we do know how in some regards through modern day warfare, nuclear war, the mark of the beast. We'll get into all that in a second. But the this discussion today is just a brief overview of what we're, we're looking at in the, the future things in this doctrine called eschatology. And so as we're looking at that, there's three views in the Great Tribulation of how this is going to play out. And we'll, we'll walk over them together. The first one is a pre-tribulation view, is meaning that the rapture happens before this intense period of suffering and judgment comes on the earth. And so the rapture happens and the church takes his, is raptured to Christ in the air, meets him in the air, and then there's a seven-year period of just unprecedented destruction and torment on earth um, through through the, 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 the schemes of the devil. This takes place over the tribulation period and then is followed by the second coming of Christ. The church is raptured out, the tribulation happens, then they're saying that Christ will come back and set up his, his earthly kingdom uh, and reign for a thousand years. That's the pre-tribulation view, meaning this is the, the, the things that happen before the great tribulation on earth is unleashed. Okay, There's another view that's called the mid-tribulation, and this is the view that the tribulation begins three and a half years into, or the rapture begins three and a half years into this great tribulation. So let's say there's a seven year period that we're looking at that's gonna be the great tribulation. Three and a half in years into this, the rapture would then occur and Christ would redeem his church and then meet him in the air. And then there would be another three and a half years of just the last three bowls in those angels' hands are terrible destruction. And so if you wanted to learn more about that, you can read Revelations 12 through 20, and it basically gives you an understanding of how we're getting this under, the, this idea of the, the bowls and the wrath of God being poured out. So the, the mid-tribulation is this view that the tribulation begins, and then midway through that, mid-tribulation, midway through that, three and a half years into it, the rapture will occur, and then the final... Um, three years of the tribulation are followed by the millennium. So some, some argue that this is a, uh, you know, a real seven-year period. Some say that it could be, I personally believe that it is a real seven-year period. And if anybody tells you they know all this stuff, uh, then they're just not telling you the truth because there's no way that we can know everything there is to know about what God has set yet to come. The only glimpse we have of this is because God allowed John, one of the disciples, to be exiled to this island of Patmos. And on this island of Patmos, when he was in exile, he was also boiled with oil, right? And he was tortured as a disciple. And God gave him this vision of what is to come. And that's the book of Revelation that we have. Uh, it is very simple. Symbolic. Some of it's over our heads. Some of it's hard to digest of what it is, but it is a fascinating study on what is to come and what must take place. So the mid-tribulation view, we've got the pre-trib means the church is raptured first before the tribulation period starts. And then Christ comes back and sets up his earthly kingdom after the uh, tribulation period, that great intense pressure. The mid-tribulation view is three and a half years pass into the tribulation, then Christ raptures the church, and then another three and a half year period of destruction and torment would be unleashed on the earth as well. The post-tribulation view means this is the view that the rapture of the church will happen after the Great Tribulation. After this seven-year period of tribulation takes place, then the rapture will take place, and then Christ will come back and, and followed by the millennium. So there's three different views on that. We'll get into that a little bit more as we discuss this in a, in a few minutes. But for the most part, what we're looking at is just to give you an idea that there are 
three different arguments from very smart people, scholars and these um, theologians all over the world that have written on pre-trib view, a mid-trib view, and a post-trib view. And most of them all can back up with scripture, okay? So I don't know where you stand. I, I, I've evolved in my understanding of where this takes place. And, you know, I'm still growing and learning. But no one can tell you for certain that they know 100% what's going to happen because we just don't know. We don't have the details we need. Uh, we have what God has given us and allowed us to part uh, participate in. But we do not know how it's going to unfold. We don't know when it's going to unfold. And, in fact, Matthew, the disciples said, no, asked Jesus, when? is this hour coming and Jesus says no man knows not even the angels know uh, when this is going to take place so God is setting the stage you can look around you can start reading into the end times might be being set up as we speak with the thing the, the way the world is politically the the powers that are coming into play the things that must happen um, and, and one of these things that must happen was you know that Jerusalem was going to be the capital city of Israel uh, that just took place last year, uh, in fact, or during the last term. And I, I don't even think our, the current, that president, President Trump, knew exactly what he was doing. But my personal view is he was setting the stage for these end time events to start to come about. And God used him to allow that piece of the puzzle to get in place that needed to be in place. So the Antichrist is another term. It's the fifth term that we need to look at. And this embodies evil and is the key agent of Satan's resistance to the plan of God in the last days. According to 1 John 2, 18 through 22 is where we see the, the development, the involvement of the Antichrist. Christ being mentioned. Um, it could be a philosophy. It could be a one world government. It could be w whatever. It could be a, a physical person. Or, um, we just don't fully know. Uh, I'm not as well versed as some of these theologians are, so I'm not going to claim to know all 100% what's going on here, but I'm just giving you some terms to help you set the stage that when you start hearing these terms, remember this is our foundations course for those believers who are new in their faith and want to go deeper, and for those that have been growing but just don't really understand some of these big concepts that we've been talking about. And so the judgment seat of Christ is the place where Christians, the Christians now, will receive their reward for the quality of life on earth according to 2 Corinthians 5.10. This is where we would get our jewels and our crowns and the things that we've done for God's kingdom would be all taken into account as a believer that we are not going to go to this judgment seat of God because we've already been judged and been found righteous by the blood of Christ. If we have been redeemed and set our hearts on him and his kingdom and believed in the finished work of Christ, the Bible says that we are made then saved from this great white judgment throne. This is the place that is not going to be fun. In Revelations 20, 11 through 15, it talks about this great white throne judgment. It gives us a glimpse of what's going to take place. And this is the place where all who have rejected God receive the punishment for their unbelief and their life on earth. So those that have believed in God are part of the redeemed and the universal church, the finished work of Christ. We are saved, if you will, um, from the wrath that God is going to pour out. Now, that doesn't mean you may ex not experience some personal tribulation along the way. You may per persecution may be a part of the picture for you, but overall, the church um, will be spared from. The majority, when I say church, I'm talking about those individuals who believe in Christ will be spared from the majority of God's wrath, okay? Because of the blood that Christ has already put on us through his son Jesus and the righteousness of the blood of the cross. Um, so this is a lot of concepts that's very difficult to understand for all of us. And for many of us, it's hard to teach through because it just we just don't have a concrete understanding of what's really taking place. But this great white throne judgment is the place where those who have rejected God here on earth and rejected rejected the call of the gospel and rejected the work of Christ, they are then judged and cast away from God eternally. Um, heaven is the ultimate destination of all people who truly believed in God and committed their lives to him, according to Acts chapter 1. Uh, hell is the ultimate destination of those people who do not believe in God and commit their lives to him. And so as we're talking about these two concepts, we're going to dive deeper into heaven and hell. But these nine terms we wanted to make sure were in front of you because you, you're going to start hearing the, the Antichrist. And as the culture continues to evolve, you're going to hear the, the 
all these different things that are going to take place, the rapture and the tribulation period and the great suffering and the millennium and, you know, the second coming of Christ are super important for us to understand in this discussion what we're talking about. So as we move into heaven and hell, we first must address death, okay? Death um, in this discussion is first mentioned, death in the Bible actually is first mentioned in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And where it is seen as a consequence of sin, God told Adam and Eve in the garden that he placed this tree um, that they should not eat from the fruit of it. They disobey God and break that law or, you know, go against what he's asked them to do. And as a result of that, all kinds of chaos ensues. Part of the reason for the fall um, shows this consequence of sin and 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 it not only affects Adam and Eve the devil comes and tempts Eve and says you should surely eat from this fruit surely God wouldn't withhold everything from you she tells the you know the serpent that God has told them specifically not to eat from this tree in the garden and every other tree that bears fruit they can eat from but this one specific one the tree of life they cannot eat from and so they break the the command that God gave them and they give in to temptation and Adam and Eve both fell uh, as a result of that temptation and sin and ate from the tree now the devil told them God told them that they would die when they ate of the tree. The devil told them that they surely would not die if they ate of the tree. And, you know, the the eventual two deaths probably occurred. The first death was a spiritual death. Everything in the garden was perfect, right? And so uh, after Adam and Eve sinned by eating of the fruit, he experienced a spiritual death from God, meaning this separation from God that everything was good. In fact, in the Bible, we see that God walked with, the, with Adam and Eve in the garden each day and after they eat of the tree and they eat of this fruit that they're not supposed to eat from then they realize they're naked then they realize they were ashamed then they realize they needed to hide from God and all these things start to play out and so as we see what's going on here God created Adam and Eve in this perfect garden there was nothing bad in it there was no sin in the world the garden was created as this perfect paradise and utopia for Adam and Eve the pinnacle of creation uh, no death had occurred we we don't know all the ins and outs of the details of scripture i mean of the the pieces of that we don't have written down for us in scripture so we can speculate what may have gone on but it picture this perfect um, community and fellowship with god that no destruction no death no nothing had entered the world uh, as a result of the fall and god when when sin entered the world it the picture effects caused death Right, this spiritual death that we're talking about, this broken fellowship with God, had it now been created. And as a result of that, there was a shame, there was sin, there was uh, a recognition that I was naked, and they had never been naked before in their eyes. And so this, this fall created a broken system that only God could fix. And so the consequences of the fall in the garden created this ripple effect, not only for Adam and Eve, but all of creation felt the sting of this call, uh, of the fall. God, in, in Genesis chapter 3, finds Adam and Eve, and he says, what have you done? And he chastises them, and he starts to then bring the judgment on them as a result of their sin of what's going to happen. The cause of that sin would now be on display. And so the consequence of sin, sin was seen and felt in all of creation, and God had to kill one of his own created animals to help Adam and Eve cover themselves. If you're not familiar with this account, they're in the garden, Adam and Eve sin, they you know, they now are ashamed and are hiding from God. They sewed fig leaves and sewed leaves together for themselves to cover up their bodies and because they were ashamed, right? And then God says, "Where why are you hiding? Who told you to do this? What's going on?" And he's having this dialogue with Adam and Eve, and as he's doing that, he then says, I've created garments for you to protect yourselves and to clothe yourselves. And so here's the progression of sins and consequence on creation from the fall that occurs in chapter 3 of Genesis. Chapter 3, 14 through 21. So the Lord said to the serpent, remember, this is the, the effects. Everything was now affected by the fall. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. That was the, the cause of the serpent, who, the great dragon, right, who caused this fall to take place or allowed the temptation to be entered in 
To the woman, he said, I will make pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire for your husband will be strong and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, you know, so there's Eve's punishment. She's going to have pain in childbearing. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree about which I commanded you not to, you must not eat from it ever again. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Through, you, through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground from where you were taken." from dust you are and to dust you will return so let's look at the consequence of these sins again right we have the first consequence is the serpent is cursed and will crawl on his belly all the days of his life he will be lower than all the other um, created animals okay painful childbirth will come upon the woman because of the sin that was created cursed is the ground the ground itself has now been cursed and thorns and thistles will come out of that there were no weeds no thorns this was a perfect garden that god created that was everything that needed for life was sustained in this garden and then we see what happens after this. This work was a result. Uh, the, now Adam had to work the ground from this so that he could eat the food. Before, the food was just there. It was available. It was He didn't have to do anything for it. And now because of this curse, he now has to go work the ground to produce the fruit from it. And as a result of this, God told him he would do that for the rest of his life. That from day one of the fall to the end of his created life, he would have to work for his food. Then God also killed an animal and made skins for them in, in Genesis 3.20. And he was kicked out of the garden. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and banished from paradise. And then death became a natural part of man. So this discussion is important in the future things because the concept of death had not entered into the world until the fall had taken place. In the Old Testament, death was final, but in the New Testament, the sting of death had been removed and it was this, no longer this weapon or this finality, but was an inconvenience for the believer and for those who trust in Christ. Death was no longer the final, final piece and the sting of death was removed by Christ's finished work on the cross. And so the New Testament, Jesus is identified as the one who holds the keys to death. Um, um, Revelations 1.18, and as has the power over death. So this brings us to our discussion on heaven and hell. We talk about this in, in regards to the future things of what's going to take place, right? We don't know everything there is. There's been some good books and documentaries and theological studies written on heaven and the concept of hell. However, more people believe in a heaven than they do in a real hell. And I don't see how you could do that. If you read the Bible, the Bible is clear that there is a judgment for those who reject God's offer of salvation. And so here we go, the concept of heaven. Is heaven real? I personally believe heaven is a real place, not a state of mind or a condition. I believe that it is a personal real place that Jesus and God told us about. Uh, when Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, he appeared with a real body capable of eating and walking and talking. So when we talk about heaven, we find the word in four senses described in the Bible. The first one is as a part of the universe that God created. When it says this, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first way that we're viewing heaven, and we'll get to our final way that we believe heaven really is for the believer uh, and what that means for us. We, we talk about heaven as a synonym for God. In Luke 15, 21, it says, I have sinned against heaven. So I have done something that has created God, the heaven, um, this perfect being. I have fallen in regards to what God has asked me to do, and I have sinned against him personally, and it's noted as heaven. Um, number three, uh, the fourth way that heaven has revealed itself in the Bible is a habitation of God. Jesus described as Jesus described God as the Father in heaven 14 times in Matthew alone. So this is God's dwelling place is heaven. And that, now God is universal. He can be anywhere at all times, any place he wants. We already discussed that in a previous thing. So as we're looking at this, heaven then, in the way that the believer looks at it, is our eternal home. All of creation is awaiting God's final act. The return of Christ will usher in the new heaven and the new earth. This event will end ordinary history. 
And so as we're looking at heaven in John 14, Jesus tells his disciples that he is going to prepare a place for them and describes heaven as a house with many rooms and a mansion with many rooms. And so when Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, the whole point seems to emphasize that heaven is a real place set before us so that we, a, a place of beauty and worship and majesty. And it is described in detail in certain Psalms. It is described in detail in other parts of the Bible. But our greatest glimpse of that comes in Revelation. Revelation. The Bible in Revelation 21 describes the majesty and the beauty of heaven and what it's going to look like. This city, this new city, Jerusalem, coming down uh, is described as this. It's 1,500 miles high by 1,500 miles long by 1,500 miles wide. Now, to put this into perspective, when we see astronauts floating above the Earth near uh, a satellite or working on the space station or something like that, they're about 200 miles above the Earth. So 1,500 miles above the Earth is a long, long ways, right? And so heaven is this massive expanse of what we're talking about for the, the biblical believer the, of the, the final resting place of those who believe in Christ. Um, the description of heaven in Revelation 21 portrays streets of gold, gates of pearl, 12 gates all made of pearl, well, a massive gate that's holding the city. Um, walls made out of precious stones like emerald and jasper. Uh, the, the, the gold is so pure, it's like crystal. You could see through it. So heaven is this place that is amazing. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 has a glimpse of heaven when God commissions him to go be his prophet for him and takes him in Isaiah 6 and he sees him and he says, I saw the angel fly with to the altar and grab an incense and put it in my, my, hand, my mouth and my lips were burned. I, was, I felt unclean. And he was seeing and describing the picture of heaven. Um, John the, 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 the disciple who was exiled to island of Patmos and wrote Revelation gives us a huge window and picture into this window of heaven. Um, it says that the foundations of the walls are adorned with all the precious stones like jasper and sapphire and agate and emerald and onyx and beryl and amethyst. I mean, heaven is this beautiful picture with there is no sun, the Bible tells us there, because the radiance of the Lord is the light the city needs. Um, so uh, another part of Revelation describes that the angels, their, their number one job is to fall down before the elders and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So it's this continual place of worship and, and, and jubilance and excellence and perfectness. The Bible also describes heaven as a wedding feast and a great banquet and a feast. And so what we decide, what we look at in church world is heaven is the final resting place for those who believe in, in Jesus and have placed their faith in him on the finished work of the cross. Uh, heaven is this real place created for those who believe in that finished work. And it is those who are going to be the redeemed that are going to participate in the great banquet in the sky. Uh, it's not some fantasy. The Bible speaks just as much about hell as it does heaven. So we believe that both places are literal and and physical places that exist. Um, the, the last picture of heaven is it'll be this eternal place of worship where the Lamb of God is surrounded by immense beauty, angels, the altar, the incense, and the continual worship of the Lamb who took away the sins of the people. And then so that brings us into our discussion on hell. Is it real? Now, some have said that hell is not a real thing. I personally believe that it is. Uh, I personally believe that God has a judgment side to him that while he extends grace and mercy to us constantly, I do believe that there is a merciful and a judgment side that is coming. And that place is described as hell. Just as we believe heaven is a real place created for those who believe in the work of Christ, as the ultimate payment for sin, then hell is a real place created for those who choose to reject that work. Uh, we believe that the, the Bible describes hell as a place of torment, a place of intense torture. Uh, Revelation 14, 9 through 11 states this about hell. And another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of God's wrath, pulled full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Also, we read in Revelation 20, 10, what, uh, that the, the devil himself will be cast into the lake of fire. So we believe that this is 
a, a real place. It says that the devil himself will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Um, the devil himself is going to be ultimately his final resting place is going to be in the lake of fire. The text seems to point that there is a real place where unbelievers will spend eternity. In fact, Jesus even describes hell in Matthew 13, 42 as a blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is the final act for those who do not believe and reject God's offer of salvation. Those who do not believe. Uh, in Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus describes a parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and he uses this to illustrate this torment that is taking place in heaven. If you, I would encourage you to go read Luke 16, 19 through 31. It is a great picture of God, Jesus, the Son of God, showing what's actually taking place in this cosmic um, eternity that we don't understand, that Christ himself understood because he created it, right? And so this illustration was a way for those to describe the fate of those who rejected him. And ultimately, the rich man dies. Here's the cap of the story. The rich man dies, and at the same time, Lazarus dies. And the rich man is sent to Sheol, or Hades, and the, the Lazarus is then sent to Abraham's bosom, or what is considered heaven. And the rich man looks up, and he sees what is taking place in heaven, and he asks Lazarus and Abraham, um, Abraham to dip their finger in their in water and just touch it on their tongue so that the the torment and the flames would be gone. And what is then described in the in the passage is you can't go this the gap is so wide and he asked that his brothers then a prophet would come and speak to his brothers so that he would not be there in this place of torment and then the, the biblical answer that was given from abraham was they have the law and the prophets if they're not going to believe those they're not going to believe a messenger sent from heaven and so we believe that hell is a real place described for those who reject the call and the finished work of Christ on the cross. They reject what God has offered as the gospel message for the saving of their faith and through the redeeming of their sins. Sin's effect on the world has created chaos. It was perfect at one time. As a result of that, even the ground was cursed, uh, where thorns and thistles grew. And the men are supposed to work their entire lives to provide food for their families. And women will experience childbirth and pain, and that would be difficult, right? And so uh, all of these things point to what God was saying. There is a future that your home is not here on this earth, that as believers that we are just a sojourners, the Bible calls it, that we are just passing through this world, and we have a choice to make to say, I want to live for God and accept what he's done for me on the cross and give my heart to him in full repentance, understanding the gospel message of Christ's love for me, or or I can reject that, and um, I can reject that offer of salvation. I cannot believe it. I can be a skeptic and try to disprove the Bible and have this hard heart that's against God and rebellious towards God. And the final results are those who believe will go to a place called heaven that God has prepared for us in John 14, as Jesus describes. And those who don't believe will be sent to a place called hell or Hades, where there'll be fire and torment forever and this eternal separation from God. I think that's the biggest, not the torment that physical, I, I don't know if it's physical or not, I can't tell. But from what the Bible tells us that we get this physical picture of, there is a fire and a flame that burns. But I feel like the, the biggest miss here is those who do not believe in God and what he's done for us on the cross through Jesus Christ, they're gonna be eternally separated from God's presence, which is the ultimate torment that no one on earth has ever experienced. Because even in our worst moments, even in the worst days of the earth, the Lord is still in control of everything that happens on earth. When you're totally separated from God's presence forever, and this I think that Jesus experienced for a split second when he took on sin on the cross and it got dark and he yells out and cries out, why did you forsake me, God? I believe at that moment the entire wrath of God that he was exercised from God's presence was revealed in, in the creation. And so 
In the conclusion of this discussion, I know there's a lot of information here, and I, I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we are not experts by any means, but we, we, we do have a little bit better understanding. Reach out to me, reach out to Ryan. We'd love to get to know some of your questions and entertain those. But look, we are not biblical experts that know all things that there is to know about heaven and hell. We just know what the Lord has revealed to us, and I personally believe that it's true and, he, and that it's real. And so here's the final conclusion. Eschatology is a study of these future things that are going to take place with the Christ, the second coming of Christ and his return for the bride of Christ, his church. All right. It's not Crossroads Fellowship Church. It's the universal church of those who believe in what he did for them on the cross. They've repented their hearts. They've turned to him and they trust him with their final salvation and ultimate end of their life. We believe that heaven is reserved for those people. We discuss these terms like the second coming and the rapture and what that means and how that plays out. And um, There's a lot that we do not know. But what we do know is evidence enough that it's not... Uh, the final chapter for humanity that once we pass through this world there is another world we either spend it eternally with God worshiping and praising him or we spend it separated from him eternally in torment and despair and so the choice is ours we have the greatest gift that God could give us and that is the gospel message it is our job as the believers to help spread the message in Matthew 28 he says go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit Making disciples is what we are supposed to do. Uh, and we, we want to do what we can to help as many people get on the, the, the narrow path that God has carved out called the, the pathway of righteousness for those who believe. And so our job as the church is to help people through our story, through our experience, and through our understanding of what God has done in us personally, is our job is to help them know him personally so they can be spared from the flames of hell. And if that doesn't motivate you, I mean, it's not a full discussion here, but the big picture of what we're talking about in these future things is we have a part to play. As the church, we have a part to play that God has orchestrated already and he has already ordained the steps of those who are coming to know him. And so he's going to use us as the agents to make that happen. And so my charge to you as a pastor and as a believer, our theme for this year is reach. How many can we reach in 2021? Right? We are trying to reach them for the gospel so they are not separated from God eternally, that their soul will live with him forever, and that God created us in such a way that we get to choose him or we get to reject him. And so my prayer is that, that we have the greatest news that the world needs, and we have the greatest gift that the world has for its biggest problem called sin, and that is the gospel of Christ, that what he did for us is he has eternal ramifications. He came to set the record straight and to be the ultimate penalty for sin. And as we believe that here at this church, we also want you to wrestle with this and take a deep dive into your own faith journey, but don't neglect the future things that God is calling us to and that future kingdom that he is setting up one day to reign eternally here on earth. So today, uh, this week, we've done it again. It is week 10. There will be another uh, discussion next week. Join Pastor Ryan as he is going to be leading us through a discussion next week on that as well. Thank you for joining Foundations. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Again, thanks so much for your time.